Okay. Welcome. My name is Mara Cecilia Asfeld. I am the Associate Director of Research Strategy and an Associate Research Scientist here at the Ford School. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon for today's policy talk at the Ford School event hosted in partnership with Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan. Tonight's conversation centers on the recently released book, Injustice of Place, uncovering the legacy of poverty in America, which links economic data, health outcomes, and local history and traditions. The Ford School's Luke Schaefer, the Herman and Amali Cohn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy and Director of Policies, Poverty Solutions, co-authored the book with Catherine Eden, a sociology professor, and Timothy Nelson, Director of Undergraduate Studies in Sociology at Princeton University. The book explores America's concentrated use of systemic violence, resource extraction, and corruption among decision makers in certain communities to create conditions of virtually inescapable poverty and adversity. Today, these communities live with severe environmental degradation, a lack of basic services, and a shortened life expectancy. And they are spread across a wide swath of the country, from Appalachia to the Tobacco Belt of Virginia and the Carolinas, the Cotton Belt in the South, in South Texas. The unfolding argument in the, justice, in the injustice of place is about what these places share a history of raw, intensive resource ex extraction and human exploitation. This history and its reverberations demand a reckoning with an unrelenting commi commitment to investing in and supporting these places in which our country has committed so many harms. A bit on format today, our own Luke Schaefer will share some insights from the book. He will then be joined by his co-authors and COO of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, Nicole Sherrod Freeman for a conversation. While the conversation originally included, included Congressman Dan Kildee, changes to the House voting schedule due to events I imagine you can all imagine prohibited him from joining tonight. There will be some time for questions at the end, so please scan the question card QR code that you should have received um, in the front to submit your questions throughout tonight's event. Those tuning in virtually, um, you can tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. We have two Ford School students here who will help us with facilitating the um, Q&A, Anna Pomper and Julie Adhikari. I'm so sorry. With that, please join me in welcoming Luke Shaver to present briefly on the book tonight. Thanks. Okay, every, everyone, it's great to be with you and I really appreciate you uh, Coming out, uh, so many people who have had an impact on this book are in this room from the great team at Poverty Solutions and, of course, my co-authors, uh, Nicole, who read chapters early on. Uh, so many of the folks who are in the field are watching are online. Um, and, of course, I, I couldn't be more grateful for the Ford School community, which uh, I've always felt uh, so embraced uh, and loved and encouraged by and challenged uh, to, to do better work and to do important work that matters. So um, Kathy uh, Eden and I wrote a book called $2 a Day that was about uh, America's very poorest families. So these are families surviving on very low levels of cash income. So they might have access to food assistance, um, sometimes a housing subsidy, although that's pretty rare in Chicago where we did a lot of our field work. The wait list to get housing, uh, housing subsidy was 85,000 families long, and, and it was closed, so you couldn't be 85,001. Um, but there was also a uh, charitable nonprofit, um, work, WIC, sort of other programs, but it was really about what happens when you don't have any cash. What does it mean to not be able to pay the utility bill or uh, buy toilet paper in 21st century America? Uh, and that book was a change in, in my own career. So before that, I'd sort of started out life as a caseworker, and that's what drew me to the work. Um, 
But uh, then during much of the early part of my career, I was strictly a quantitative researcher. That's uh, through uh, graduate school. I developed my love for uh, charts and spreadsheets that make me feel really warm and cuddly inside. Um, and so in meeting Kathy, she would do this thing, uh, which uh, was different from what I did, which was when she wanted to learn about poverty in America, she would go out and talk to people. Uh, and so this book, the first book really sort of helped us learn things that I think by going out and actually connecting and talking, uh, we wouldn't have never known, you know, the questions that we didn't even know to ask. Uh, but very quickly after that, we started to uh, wonder about sort of a different level of analysis of maybe wanting to go and see the poorest places in the United States. And we actually got an email from um, a program officer. It's like, one of those wonderful things that you never actually imagine happening when a program officer actually writes you and says, hey, I want to fund you to do this work uh, that uh, you wanted to do anyways. Uh, so I expect that's a once in a career type situation, but uh, this was a good one to spend it on. So uh, she called and said, hey, what, what about a book that would not just look at America's poorest families, but would look at America's poorest places and try to understand uh, what's uh, going on with them? So uh, we thought that was pretty interesting. And of course, there was uh, William Julius Wilson's seminal work, The Truly Disadvantaged, that really made the argument that uh, growing up poor in a poor community uh, had compounded effects. Um, but uh, much of that work that sort of came out of that explosion of research uh, was really focused on neighborhoods, mostly in urban areas. And in fact, um, pretty much all of our research, except uh, one field site in $2 a day, uh, was in urban centers in the north. Um, and then, of course, uh, Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hindren had work that was coming out that showed uh, how stratified the American dream is by place. So there are some places in the United States where if you grow up low income, you are just as likely as anyone else to rise to the middle class. And then there are other places where if you grow up low income, you are likely to be poor uh, as an adult as well. We could see more and more research from uh, Anga Steeton and Ann Case and others that showed the huge stratification in health. If you go from counties, you know, even just small units of geography right here in Washtenaw County, you can see uh, differences in life expectancy that go beyond a decade. Um, and uh, very significant differences in infant mortality. And of course, poverty rates are quite different across place. So uh, we wanted to bring together uh, not just one source of data to think about how do we get to America's poorest places. And in fact, we really wanted to try to offer a new way to think about poorest. What does it mean to be poorest? The, uh, the federal government has always used income to, to figure out who is who is the least, who's the least likely to be able to meet their expenses. But we've had this huge um, explosion in our data infrastructure, and we can, we can put these different factors into conversation with each other. So uh, in, in our analysis, we used income, the sort of the standard official poverty measure is what we can look at uh, for small units of geography all across the country. And in fact, it's actually a bit more uh, correlated with hardships like food insecurity than some of our other measures. We looked at health, and then we looked at social mobility, right? That sort of question of whether or not in a place, if you grow up without a lot, are you likely to uh, be poor as an adult too? And we use a principal component analysis. So uh, postdoctoral scholar Sylvia Robles, uh, who was here at uh, the Ford School, was the first one to suggest this. Our student Jasmine Simington, uh, she was an, another, and Sam Jubayed, one of my team members at, the, at Poverty Solutions, sort of came on the idea of using principal component analysis that can sort of weight all of these factors and then uh, sort of spit out a continuum of disadvantage for every county in the United States in our 500 largest cities. And when you look at the 500 largest cities, that gets you down to cities that are like 50,000 uh, or so uh, type places. And this was the map that it, that it gave us. So uh, we can immediately see one thing that was very striking to us at the, at the beginning is on this map, you have both every county in the United States, about 3,100 uh, counties in every city. And uh, what was striking was when we looked at that um, deepest disadvantage set, like the, the, the bottom 100 on our index of deep disadvantage, they were 
uh, really predominantly rural. In fact, uh, there are only nine cities, uh, two of which happen to be in Michigan, in Detroit, and Flint. Um, a couple of others uh, here in the, in the Rust Belt. Um, but besides that, you had these clusters of a deep disadvantage that you can see sort of going across um, the Cotton Belt, the Mississippi Delta, and through the, uh, the south, Appalachia a little bit higher up, and then a cluster down in south Texas. And if we look out west, you actually see a, a very few places that are among the most disadvantaged, except for some examples, which are all uh, native nations as you, go, as you go out west. So um, for scholars who had spent almost our entire career studying poverty in, in northern cities like Chicago, uh, or New York, uh, this was a, a wake-up call for us, right? Sort of saying that, um, you know, we'd sort of seen some maps that had looked like this before, but this was the first apples, apples comparisons of all cities, all 500 largest cities in every county in the United States. And it was really pointing us to these rural places that, uh, very f that we hadn't spent a lot of time in and, and most of our colleagues hadn't either. So here you can see uh, exactly what these clusters are, right? So it's not just that you have small pockets of these disadvantage, but they seem to be clustered together. And uh, immediately we started looking for other maps and thinking about how the work of today connected with um, other, other things. We'd seen maps of poverty. Um, you know, there are some places that actually have a decent poverty rates, but terrible social mobility and terrible health. So we brought some new things to the table, but in another case, uh, maybe we didn't bring new things to the table. So uh, one of our, uh, um, one of the members of our research team brought this map that is on your right uh, from 1860. So this is a map of the concentration of enslavement in 1860. And uh, to, the, to your left is a comparison to our map today. And you can see there's not even a rough just a rough correlation, but the very sort of gradation of, of this is deeply tied to each other. So that made us to think about sort of a third type of analysis that was gonna be critical to our work, right? We have a quantitative work, which is using all the data infrastructure we can to zero in on disadvantage. Um, qualitative work of wanting to go to these places and actually talk to families. And then historical analysis and understanding that all of the problems that we face today as society did not appear out of thin air. And I think much of the time, social science uh, comes to a place of saying, yeah, yeah, we understand history is important, and then we can just set that aside and go to basically doing analysis that assumes that our problems appeared out of thin air. And obviously, sort of these deep relationships, um, uh, not just a decade ago, not just half a century, but uh, one and a half centuries ago, uh, tell us that history plays a much bigger role than we thought. So uh, we uh, wanted to actually get to know these places, and so our research teams uh, started to set out. Um, my, my wife, who was here, who was uh, uh, you know, given all sorts of support and had to, uh, to live with me through the process of this book, said, your graduate students actually want to go live in poor places uh, and study them? This is like... Uh, fun for them. Uh, so we have Nora, uh, Nora Jones, I'm sorry, no, Nora Johnson, of course, Nora Jones being a, a famous singer of my generation. Uh, uh, I don't know, do you have a singing voice, Nora? Oh, well, we'll talk about that later, yeah. Um, uh, Karen, who is now the Associate Director for Poverty Solutions, um, Jasmine up at the top, uh, and so we've got Princeton researchers, U of M researchers, going out in pairs, uh, getting to know communities in our clusters. So uh, we find ourselves in Clay County, um, uh, Clay County, Kentucky, Marion County, South Carolina, Lafleur County in, uh, in Mississippi, and then Zavala County in South Texas. And one of the nice things about our research team is that uh, most of them had some direct connection, some tie to the community that they were studying, having either grown up in the region or having family in the region. And so we were able to, uh, I think, build on that fami familiarity. So the, what the book really tries to do is offer some mechanisms. So the, the quantitative work of figuring out these are the most disadvantaged places doesn't really tell us the why in any way, shape, or form. And the history tells us that this is sort of tied to the past. 
But going to these places and interviewing a set of very low income residents, as well as a set of community leaders, and then being deeply embedded in the ethnography and as investigators, we were coming down um, and uh, getting to know each place over and over again. And then uh, Kathy and Tim went on this epic road trip where they actually visited about 75% of the nation's poorest 200 places in the, in, 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 the, in the country. I think probably visited more poor places in the United States than any other human uh, in history. Um, we uh, developed sort of this sense of some of the mechanisms that were driving this sort of perpetuation of deep disadvantage over time. And I'm just going to talk about two. And uh, these are two in particular that caught me by surprise. So I, I like to say that this project and this sort of iterative mixed methods inquiry often means that you come out thinking about and studying and writing about things that you never expected to going in. So it's a little bit different from when you you go in with a research question and then you start to dig in. Um, this is one where we sort of went in almost as a, as a, as a blank slate and uh, maybe had some preconceptions, um, but uh, found ourselves driven in directions we never would have imagined. So the first is social infrastructure. So think about Clay County, Manchester, Kentucky. Um, it is uh, a place where uh, the opioid epidemic is still raging, and we're all sort of searching for answers of what exactly should we do? What are some of the causes that help us understand uh, why the opioid epidemic continues to be really uh, as bad as it's ever been as a country, and particularly concentrated in these places? Well, it turns out a lot of our respondents had some of these answers, or at least had a had a hypothesis. So Sweet Pea says, there's really nothing around here to do for kids. That's why they go to drugs. Uh, Dolly says, I just want things to change. I mean, better for the kids, better for the teenagers, stuff teenagers can do instead of getting into drugs. Parks for the little kids. Uh, down with Crystal, we have, like we had the movies a long time ago, and like I said, it turned into a church, and now there's nothing uh, for folks to do. Time and time again, uh, we heard this. And quite frankly, the first couple times we heard it, we didn't take it seriously. It kind of sounds like a non-serious answer. But with this type of inquiry, when you hear it over and over again, you're forced to say, all right, can there be something to this? And it turns out there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that there is. So just to give you three quick examples, uh, there is um, one study that finds the decline of civic organizations within a community is associated with the rise of, of opioid deaths. In our own analysis with Mike Evangelist, uh, who is also a postdoc here at the Ford School, we find that the decline of things like the arcade and barbershops, uh, these are things that are associated with increases in opioid epidemic. And the associations are as strong as rises of unemployment. So it's a, it's a pretty strong association. And we can't, you know, there's some sort of causal direction that we still have to work out, but it looks pretty compelling. So what does an arcade do, right? What does the local movie theater do? These are places where people can gather and form bonds and have cheap fun, right? And, and be together. Um, there are things for people to do. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, some uh, research using uh, laboratory rats. It turns out if there's a, a poor laboratory rat that's all by their lonesome they, uh, and, and they're offered drugs, they will probably get addicted to drugs and die. And if the little rat has other little rat friends and fun stuff to do in the cage, n n almost none will get addicted and none will, uh, will die. So there's like, like all of these little things that sort of point to the fact that these social connections that we build by having these places where we can come together to have fun can actually matter. Volunteerism is another one of these maps that looks an awful like our map of deep disadvantage. All right, so just one more, and then I'm going to stop the presentation and invite my colleagues to come up. Uh, corruption, another uh, theme that I never expected to write about going in. I'd never written anything about corruption whatsoever. But uh, it turns out uh, Greenwood, Mississippi is the epicenter of the Brett Favre uh, welfare crisis. So. As, as some of you may know, Brett Favre got himself into trouble um, because he took $1.1 million for speeches uh, for underserved individuals in Mississippi, which came from funds from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, 
which was supposed to be the welfare program that replaced welfare in 1996. And we all at the time thought it was a, a work-based, time-limited program. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's, it's more just a flexible uh, uh, spending block grant that states can use as long as they can justify what they're doing under one of the core purposes. They just have to say that it helps promote marriage or reduce out-of-marriage births or help families and their, their uh, children. And so states have really uh, pulled away from providing any cash assistance and are doing a lot of other things, usually paying for things they were going to pay for otherwise, like their child welfare system. In this case, Nancy New was a nonprofit leader in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi, who uh, worked in league with state officials to take $80 million uh, from the TANF block grant and do things like pay herself to run schools that didn't exist, uh, pay Brett Favre to give speeches that there's no record that he gave um, at any point, uh, and all sorts of other celebrities, uh, including one fellow uh, who was a, uh, I think he was a former wrestler who was paid to give uh, um, speeches about staying away from drugs, and then he himself uh, got addicted and TANF paid for him to go to rehab in California. Uh, so, um, this is the biggest welfare uh, sort of uh, scandal in Mississippi history. Um, and it all started in the community like during the time that we were in, during the time uh, that we were there. Um, and it directly is taking money out of the hand, you know, the pockets of low-income families with children. Uh, some of the other cases are uh, a little bit more indirect. So in Crystal City, Texas, where uh, was a field site that we had in South Texas, um, in 2016, the FBI descends onto City Hall and arrests every member of the city council and the mayor and the city manager, save one. And they actually took all of the public records, uh, all of the records that had been used to run the government of, of everything that had been going on, so that the next guy who comes in to try to run the town knows absolutely nothing about what had been happening in the town over the previous years. Um, of course, uh, uh, Manchester, Kentucky is uh, the place where the history of this, uh, the history goes back of this sort of thing in every community that we're in over long term, uh, but it's, it's perhaps not, uh, it's just unparalleled in, in Manchester, where um, uh, finally in the early 2000s, Daw White, who is a direct descendant of one of the founders of, of, of the county from generations back, um, is put in jail for racketeering. Um, there's lots of like taking money for bribes, uh, public officials that are in league with drug dealers uh, over, the, over the period of time. And um, one of my favorite stories is that there was a, a group that, of reformers who uh, came in because they, they couldn't stand the uh, corruption anymore, and they challenged Dahl White and all of his, um, his slate and they won, but then they themselves ended up in prison because they were buying votes, uh, which turns out you can't do. Uh, uh, because that's what you had to do to win, right? And so it turns out Dahl White, uh, who himself is facing charges, his people saw the other people uh, buying votes while they were buying votes, and so they were able to testify against them. So um, if we imagine, if we understand corruption as uh, sort of something that appeared out of thin air, I think it's easier to blame communities for it and to say, look, there's nothing that can be done. Um, but when we take the historical lens and we understand every single one of these places uh, for generations has been fighting a battle between the haves and the have-nots. And usually the haves, in, in all of the cases in these places, the haves are a relatively small set of elite who run not just the industry that dominates the place, but social life as well, um, and has been using every uh, tool at their disposal to reinforce that social order, right? What um, became something that we might blame on the community themselves uh, becomes sort of a long historical trend of a group of people who are controlling the towns sort of maintaining that control and oppressing a much larger group of people, which is why in the book we come to term these places internal colonies. Their stories uh, have been told, uh, but separately, as individual places. And in this book, we don't say that there's equivalence at all across the places, but we do understand uh, that these are places where uh, the large majority of people have been 
not have full, had full rights of citizenship for, um, uh, for much of their history because of this extreme control of usually one industry that dominates the entire place and all social aspects of life as well. So uh, we are going to talk about policy solutions because this is a policy school, but in the, uh, I'm going to invite my colleagues up and sort of start the conversation there. And, and of course, this is not a book where there's a single uh, solution. So at our last book, it was great. Like the solution was give people a little bit of money. Uh, this is not one of those where you know one solution uh, really fits the bill. So I'm going to invite uh, my my dear dear friend Nicole Sherard Freeman, who is now the COO of um, the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan, but has spent many years as a cabinet official in the Mike Duggan administration, uh, running workforce development and uh, economic development. And Kathy Eden, uh, my longtime collaborator, and, and Tim, now my collaborator, uh, both faculty at, at Princeton and, and I think well known here. So let's invite them all up. You guys are in the middle. Testing, testing. <laughs> so first, um, so I have to start with uh, a big thank you and shout out to the Ford School of Public Policy and to the Poverty Solutions team and to Luke and Kathy and Tim for inviting me to join you today. It is a privilege and an honor to be before you this afternoon to help this conversation uh, along. Um, so I was a huge fan uh, of $2 a day. I gave away no fewer than uh, 35 copies uh, <laughs> of that book. Um, and that, I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, your approach to writing uh, that book and this one uh, has been life-changing for me. So I am a big fan and uh, am deeply grateful to you for the uh, index of deep disadvantage. I wanna start here in the conversation. So for anyone in our viewing audience, uh, who cares at all about the conditions under which far too many Americans are living. This book was a hard read. And so I wonder if we could just start with your talking about what it was like for you personally to write this book. Luke, why don't, why don't we start with you? So I think a number of things, uh, the first was how surprising I found uh, every aspect of the work that I thought I knew things about poverty, and I think I did, but uh, there was so much that I didn't know, and sort of grappling with uh, how easy it is to get stuck in one's positionality and stuck in where one lives and what one sees every day and sort of only know a certain set of problems. This completely blew that open for me. Uh, in, a, in a different way. And then the field work really was like the, the housing stock, especially in South Texas, um, but across all of our field sites, it, it was it's fundamentally different. We were in communities that had only gotten indoor you know, plumbing uh, in the last decade or so. And so um, that was, you know, it's a set of conditions that was not familiar to me as someone who spent an awful lot of time in uh, Chicago and Detroit and, and other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy, how about you? So I'm from rural America. I'm from a little town in the middle of Minnesota called Staples. Uh, there's nothing interesting about Staples. <laughs> <laughs> and I really thought I knew rural, right? I know what rural people are like. I grew up rural. And uh, my rural was not this rural. And so when we think about rural, we often think about white communities. And our public discourse is all about uh, white Republican communities. Um, but the communities that we identified here outside of Appalachia uh, were communities of color. And I had no clue how these places worked. You know, it was stunning to realize in Manchester that um, the, very, the very first capitalist, uh, Hugh White, uh, uh, who was mining salt, uh, uh, using enslaved people uh, for labor uh, back in the 1820s was the direct descendant of the guy who was still running the town. Uh, so these kinds of power structures really um, uh, were, very, were very stunning. And then the, the, the social cleavages were so 
extreme. You know, um, I grew up in central Minnesota during the Garrison Keillor years. We know he's controversial, but he did famously say that everybody's just a little above average, and there were no people in the middle in many of these towns. There were elite people and people without land or resources. Yeah, I'd say that was, um, so Kathy and I, I should say that we're married, that's why we get to go on these road trips together. And stuff. That's, uh, <laughs> we don't let him come. That's right. <laughs> but so we have, um, for our, some of our prior work, we lived in places like uh, Camden, New Jersey in the mid 90s um, and, and other places. So we've been exposed to a lot of uh, poverty and, and so on. But what was di different about this was, as Kathy said, it wasn't just uh, a uniform level of desolation. Every town in the South that we looked at had like um, a historic mansion, had a nice store that was catering to some of the elites in the area. And it was that sort of juxtaposition and the inequality that was operating here. And doing the historical work and looking how far back this goes, uh, which was uh, really eye-opening for me. You know, what you've shared today in this um, brief and but thorough uh, executive summary, and then certainly what you get uh, when you read the book, uncovers a set of conditions and circumstances that are deeply, deeply troubling. That goes without saying. In $2 a day, and I'll bring this back to a point, Luke, that you made just a minute ago, you were able to conclude uh, with you know, it's not that, that the child tax credit or give people a little bit of money was simple, but it was an idea we could wrap our heads around pretty readily. Can you talk about how your policy recommendations have evolved at this point uh, since $2 a day? Well, um, the child tax credit, I do think, was a pretty good idea uh, and uh, seems, to have, uh, seems to have worked for the brief moment that we had it. And so out of $2 a day, Kathy and I you know, collaborated with uh, like eight other scholars. So it's the only paper I'll ever write with uh, eight co-authors, uh, but it was worth it. Uh, and, uh, and that sort of rolled into the American Family Act that rolled into um, the American Rescue Plan. And we saw child poverty plummet. Uh, we saw food hardship hit, hit the lowest level um, that, that it ever had for families with kids. Uh, we saw the family, number of families at the end of 2021 that said they could handle a $400 expense hit an all-time high, uh, and just many other metrics of uh, financial health. But that doesn't get at these place-based differences. Now, it does in one, in one way, uh, which uh, Kathy was saying earlier, which is um, we can actually get that money to everyone across place. When we do a federal policy that treats everyone the same across the nation, we can actually get that money to everyone. And it's, it's actually much more difficult than a lot of what we do with programs and grants, and you have to have grant writers uh, to, to get that money. But I think more is needed to figure out uh, how, do we, the, how do we help places where, that have these huge disparities. And, um, and it doesn't really... Uh, it doesn't really lend itself to one solution. So, so money and uh, government policies that can treat people equally, I think, is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, it goes all the way down to things like um, local journalism. So we wouldn't know about the Mississippi welfare scandal if it weren't for Anna Wolf, who was at Mississippi Today, now has won the Pulitzer Prize, was writing about it for years before uh, anyone noticed. So thinking about how do we actually support local journalism to follow their nose and not, um, uh, not die, as, as so many are, uh, is sort of one policy solution that I think can help. So there are both, you know, these are huge problems, and they require sort of a Marshall Plan type solution on the one hand. But on the other hand, there is a lot of low hanging fruit. So. Um, for example, uh, the federal government is actually prohibited in investing in social infrastructure, keeping these third places that where people build social bonds. Uh, but there's nothing to say that our 130,000 nonprofits can't come alongside of local government and begin uh, to really think about ways to restore the kind of social infrastructure in a community that builds a net 
that can catch people when they fall. Uh, we saw powerfully that when that net was rent, uh, people were, were overdosing from opioids at very high rates. And so I think that's, that's a little insight that um, a lot of our nonprofit partners have been very excited about, a, a way to, uh, to really invest. We also uh, write about um, separate and highly unequal schools. So something you could advocate for you, if, especially if you're from one of these states, is that universal vouchers, uh, which are being implemented in more and more states where everyone can use a voucher to go to any school, um, are, show very little, uh, if anything, in the way of educational gains, uh, but can f act to further southern uh, school segregation and, in fact, are being used uh, right now across the South to, to support kids who are going to the very segregation academies that were stood up in the aftermath of Brown uh, to, to basically uh, undo uh, integration in the South. Uh, so so that's, that's sort of another puzzle. How do you really think about um, ways to prevent um, your state legislature from, uh, and your, in your governor from, from taking you know, voucher programs that are targeted and have been shown to, to work well uh, and, and transforming them into universal voucher programs which allow uh, white parents to take their kids out of integrated schools. Uh, we learned a lot about violence in this book, and I, uh, Tim and I both studied violence along with this work, uh, but nowhere in the violence conversation uh, do we really talk about the fact that the, the, one of the strongest prediction, predictors of violence, in fact we do this empirical work in this book, is the rate of social mobility. Now think about that for a minute. The whole reason social mobility is very low in the South is because everything about the economies and the, and the social situations in the South was orchestrated to keep the working folk down, right? And so uh, we asked the question in this book, to the extent to which that violence, and, and of course violence was the tool. Violence was ultimately the tool used to keep the laboring class down. So we ask in this book, to the extent that a, a community is successful in pushing uh, the working folk down and keeping them in their place, does that then lead to further violence? And we find very strong evidence that indeed it is. So if you're trying to fight violence in a community and you're not paying attention to opportunities for real, meaningful social mobility, uh, you're probably putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Sometimes I uh, say that this is the only book we've written that actually has villains in it, and the, the villains are really, unfortunately, the local elites, as, as you've probably been able to, to capture. So I think sometimes there's this idea of, of, well, we're outside this community, they're all homogenous there, and mm -hmm. that's definitely what, what we found was not the case. And it makes me understand and actually appreciate the when Johnson launched the War on Poverty, one of the more controversial things was the the stipulation for maximum feasible participation among the poor, which was not always followed and actually quite um, violently resisted in some of these uh, places. But you do need some kind of mechanism to, um, to give aid to these places without the, um, it going into the pockets of, of local elites. Yeah. I want to, um, if I might, just take a moment to talk about your point about a, a, a Marshall Plan kind of approach and in, in being able to get resources to places. I mean, I think we saw that play out with the American Rescue Plan Act. So mm -hmm. I have the uh, distinct privilege and heavy burden of managing yeah. about $200 million in American Rescue Plan Act dollars in the city of Detroit for a combination of small business development and workforce development and economic mm -hmm. development and blight remediation, uh, both at the, you know, not, not at the residential level, but commercial and industrial blight. So really mm -hmm. making these places, places where investment uh, is possible. And part of what we did with that funding in Detroit was spend a little bit of time talking with community-based organizations mm -hmm. and making investments where mm -hmm. uh, possible to help rebuild the social uh, infrastructure that you're talking about. I mean, we, we felt very intensely the impact of not having that uh, in the community. You can see how it starts to fray the edges and then really you know, decays the, the very center 
Yeah, one of the programs that you stood up that I, I like the most and maybe is a, is a model here, it's a community health corps. So uh, a group of Detroiters who were, were paid to help other Detroiters navigate systems. And so through doing that, there was this building of human capital of a set of longtime residents uh, who are working in the program, so not social workers, but uh, longtime residents, building a lot of uh, actually research about community health workers that was done here in, in, at U University of Michigan and providing that direct benefit to other Detroiters. So I think that's the type of model that maybe can help us avoid the elite capture of, uh, of not seeing any of those dollars actually go down to um, the residents on a large scale. So one thing you'll notice about these places is, um, uh, and I love the fact that Luke has these phenomenal local examples um, that you two know so well. Um, but one thing that we saw in, in all of these places was that after these internal colonies that had really ruled these places began to fall apart in the 1960s, many of these places did begin to industrialize. You had the what Russell Stover planted in um, Marion County. You had just all Baldwin Piano in LaFleur County. Uh, there's all of this nascent industrialization uh, it was almost like, you know, being in Philadelphia in 1900, all these little businesses just springing up all over, providing a variety of places for folk to work. And if you talk to poor people in these communities today, many of them worked in those places and losing those businesses in the face of NAFTA and other trade policy changes, which literally wiped them out after 1990, is like a psychic wound. You know, they really took their identity from uh, a form of work that at least in relative terms was much more dignified than the sharecropping and, and cotton chopping that they had been doing for, for generations. So, so, you know, we, we talk about the fact that if we're going to help the, if we're going to help these programs rebuild, we really need uh, to, to realize that these trade policies uh, really had losers. And uh, when you have losers, um, it could be that the country benefited. I don't know that we know that that's true, but when you have a region that is locked so deeply and that has still so many of uh, our country's most vulnerable uh, people in it, uh, there has to be some uh, reparation. There has to be some compensation. And so in, in some ways, um, we, we um, pulled the rug out from under the feet. Yes, the local elites are a problem. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, you have to have something to build on. So uh, one big idea is to really rethink trade policy in the United States. Uh, yes, perhaps we've um, reduced policy in the rest of the world, but, but still, um, you know, 60% of African Americans live in the South. 40, 44% of, of Hispanics live in the four border states. Uh, very large swaths of white poor people live in the South. And uh, they need to be compensated, and, and these economies need, need a chance to grow. Uh, just one other thing I will say is oftentimes uh, through an RFP process, uh, it is either no one in the community who writes the grant to get the goods or a local elite. And we have many examples in the book of utter boondoggles of economic development that get uh, funded as a result. Uh, we need to bring experts together, and I think local universities, extensions, uh, local federal reserve, regional federal reserve banks really need to put um, their shoulders to the wheel and, and think deeply, like, what is the scope of this problem? We're, we're kind of picking around the edges at the moment. Uh, we're making ourselves feel good through these little programs, um, but this is, this, is a big, this is a big problem uh, that needs a, um, a, a, a muscular, I've just been in Chicago, so I'm thinking of the city of big shoulders, a, you know, a muscular uh, response. Yeah, so uh, each of the policy um, suggestions in the book really focus on the different mechanisms that Luke laid out in, in the slide. So we really go through the violence and the corruption, the education and so on. And um, sort of as a proof of concept that these are actually, you know, the mechanisms that are achieving these things, we went, uh, part of our road trip was to go uh, to the most advantaged counties. So on that list, if you look at the other end of the list, and we looked at the 200 
most advantaged places, which includes Kathy's home county <laughs> of Minnesota. Um, but, and we also looked at the numbers for these, and so these are the least corrupt places. These are the places with great social infrastructure uh, and so on. And if you trace back the history, it often, um, it seems to go back to the, to the very, uh, like the Homestead Act of 1862, which actually laid out a very even set of uh, parcels for different family farms and so on. Of course, those were all taken from, you know, the native people who lived there. But establishing this kind of equality um, seem to have, have really echoed across the generations in creating these very healthy, sustainable types of communities. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to press into that point because there, there came a point for me mm -hmm. uh, personally in reading the book where I had to like, I, I don't know, maybe it was in the middle of a couple of chapters just before we start talking about what do we do. Um, and it was just too painful to keep reading it. I, I eventually went back and finished the book, but there, there came a point where when I had to fast forward past mm -hmm. some of the discussion of the impact of history and current context on violence in a place because it was just too much. And I, um, I moved forward to the chapter on uh, healing uh, internal, healing America's internal colonies. And it builds on the point, Tim, that you just raised. And there's a passage there that, Luke, I wonder mm -hmm. if we could um, get you to read for us um, that sort of lays out, I think, uh, put some structure around, Kathy, what you and Tim were just describing. With important caveats about the most advantaged places in mind, the key lesson we have taken from our exploration of these places is that people seem to thrive, maybe not in wealth, but in health and life chances, when inequality is low, when land ownership is widespread, when social connection is high, and when corruption of the kind seen in some of our field sites is virtually unknown, and violence is rare. The social leveling that is characteristic of these communities in the upper Midwest is more than just a quaint cultural feature. It is the engine that drives the social and economic processes from which its citizens derive benefits. I wonder if you could, thank you, Luke. I wonder if you could each talk a little bit about what, what our risks are and what there is to be gained from caring about building places of advantage or, or I don't know, dismantling some of the disadvantage. I don't, I don't, I don't even have the language for, for what you've uncovered, but I, I wonder if you might each talk a little bit about that. I was thinking about um, the political context uh, and the political costs of doing nothing. Um, so right when we were writing this book, um, a visiting speaker came to Michigan and presented this amazing paper. Am I right? About the camps? Which oh, one are you thinking of? Camps. Which one are you thinking of? Anyway, the, we discovered a body of research. Um, David Autor is one of, one of several um, scholars writing in this vein, really showing uh, the political content, uh, consequences of NAFTA. And uh, you know, prior to NAFTA, uh, many of these southern places uh, voted blue in presidential mm. elections, right. trusting the Democrats to deliver the jobs and to care about um, labor. Uh, after NAFTA, what you can see is for those counties that were most affected uh, by trade policy, and they were our very counties, I mean literally, you know, Zavala County, <laughs> Texas, the list is, is astonishing and really marking which places they were. Uh, these are the places that you saw the shift um, from Democratic to Republican uh, voting patterns in presidential elections. So uh, one answer I would give is um, these processes are changing our politics in dramatic ways. And uh, the cost of, so this leads to feelings of alienation, feelings of being left behind, uh, all, you know, resentment of the kind that, um, that our great ethnographer, um, Kathy Kramer, University of Wisconsin has written about. Uh, it really leads to the sense that uh, politicians don't care. We know that Americans are more disengaged and more distrustful of politicians than maybe any time uh, since we've started measuring these kinds of attitudes. 
So, so some of these policies may be really driving some of the political d dislocation um, and change that, uh, that we're seeing today. And so that's, that, to me, is a pretty big cost for doing nothing. I would go back to uh, what Tim was mentioning in the historical legacy when we look at the places of greatest advantage, which we were a bit surprised to see according to our index up in the upper Midwest in Minnesota and North Dakota and Wisconsin, this deep concentration of places uh, that were affected by the Homestead Act of 1862. The Homestead of the Act of 1862 that actually couldn't get passed before 1862 because uh, Southern lawmakers blocked it uh, for that same, uh, before that, and so they were able to pass it in 1862. They didn't want the common person to have land. <laughs> so it, it, it like, uh, causes this explosion in, of widespread uh, property ownership, but you can think of it as widespread assets. Right, inclusive sort of asset ownership uh, across an entire region where we can trace the legacy of that ever since. And in the South, after the Civil War, we started down that path. Actually, Sherman and I think Sam and Chase uh, go down to Savannah and talk to a group of black leaders and say, what do you want? Like, what should, you know, what they were talking about was reparations. And it was uh, black leaders who said, we want land and some assets to get going. And that's what they did. They started to confiscate you know, a set of land from, they, they took it from the plantations and, and started you know, uh, building 40 acres and a mule, the mule being the asset. And then Lincoln uh, gets shot and then uh, Andrew Johnson comes in and all of that gets reversed. And even so, actually, black Americans in the South build like property ownership at a, like an astonishing rate over the next few decades. And then in the early 1900s, like forces across, um, you know, from during the Great Depression, who's available uh, to get, you know, uh, agricultural loans uh, from, from banks, you know, from local to, uh, to federal regulations, a lot of that land is again stripped. About 94%. So uh, this is, I mean, to me, I think there's like two lessons in that. And the, the first is that um, I'm, an, I'm generally an income guy, right? I like to give people money and let them decide what to do with it. But wealth and assets, right, has this, seems to have this role in um, providing sort of the leverage point for people to, to build and think about, you know, the better life. And uh, the United States has sort of systemically, uh, you know, supported some people in that and systemically worked against other people, per per particularly black Americans, over a long period of time. So um, I like to think of uh, one of the contributions of this book is, is being a book about the nuts and bolts of structural racism as well as, like, structural classism in Appalachia of how how government's been used in very specific ways. One of my favorite passages is uh, on the segregationist academies after Brown and how all the assets of the public schools were uh, you know, literally converted overnight in a lot of these places to private schools um, that were all white. And so they were able to sort of replicate the system that they already had. So I think understanding how government can be used in that way and then understanding the opposite, which is to endow citizens with assets uh, so that they can thrive um, be in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had, um, some of this book was excerpted in the Atlantic and then in USA Today, and I was the only one brave enough to go and see the reader's comments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was interesting, a lot of people said, well, if these places are so terrible, why don't they just leave? Like, why don't they just move? Um, and of course, they did move, right? This little thing called the Great Migration happened <laughs> in, uh, you know, for most of the, of the 20th century. Also, um, actually a larger number of, uh, of Appalachian whites moved to northern cities, um, which uh, there's a new book out called The Hillbilly Highway, which really kind of looks at that. Um, but a lot of people then returned back because of the reception that they were given in a lot of... Uh, northern cities, but also just because of a deep attachment to the home place. Um, so when, when we give the sort of longer presentation here, we often end with slides just showing the children in some of these places and saying, you know, these kids that are growing up in these areas who have deep roots here, they deserve our attention. They deserve our coming together to think about solutions that will allow them to stay
where their families have, have been and have, have really, you know, great roots. And Tim, to that point, and this question is, is for all three of you, but what, what gives you hope? What did you see or what do you know through some other way or what do you believe that gives you hope that our electeds and or our civic leaders and or other community leaders or that just residents in the places where you were, like what gives you hope that we care enough about justice in a place to actually do something about it. Yeah, so, um, so we talk about the local elites, many of whom have been problematic for decades and, and have operated as extractors, not investors. You know, in the Midwest, you invest in the soil so you can pass it on to your children and grandchildren. But this is really an extractive uh, way of thinking. Um, so, so the local elites are a problem, but they're also hometown heroes, uh, like Pastor Ken Bolin, who, who led uh, the opposition against the White Klan and all of the corruption, and uh, organized a, a march against uh, all of this corruption that a quarter of the county's population showed up at on a rainy day in May. We also see uh, people who, from the laboring folk, who manage to get out, they go and they get advanced educations, they get incredible experience and expertise uh, in the big cities in the north where so many migrants went, uh, but then they decide to come home. So uh, Tamala Boyd Shaw, as one example, she comes back to Greenwood, uh, Mississippi, uh, to, f to start a, charter, start a char charter school, the LaFleur Legacy Academy. Uh, there's another couple, um, uh, Deborah Adams, and I'm forgetting her husband's name. He's actually Ernest. Um, they've uh, been running pro programs for youth very successfully in a large city, but they come home and they uh, resuscitate the very community center, the Catholic community center, where the priest, uh, Pastor Mikulski, actually, uh, during the Civil Rights Mo Movement, uh, um, bails Stokely Ky Carmichael out of jail after the Black Power speech. And so everywhere we looked, we saw folk with expertise. I mean, Mike Espy was an early example of this, where people were coming back to these hometowns, and they're saying, this is my place. And, uh, you know, so Tamala Boysha and uh, Deborah Adams went to the Cotton Bowl, the all-white event where the Cotton King and the Cotton Queen are crowned every year, and they're, the next year, um, they brought a whole table of their associates and friends. And so all across these places, you're seeing uh, sort of a new cadre of leaders. If we can get rid of gerrymandering in some of these states, we could see more of these leaders uh, at the national level. And, and they've got something to say. The other thing I'd say is there's an air of desperation among the, the, the white elite. Uh, there's a sense that if we don't change, we don't, we die. And so we did see some real openness um, in several of our sites among longtime local leaders who are saying, you know, why did we say we wouldn't go to school with these people way back when? What if we had, you know, gone to each other's weddings and been in each other's weddings and, and been friends? Wouldn't our town be better off? So that's, that's what gives me, me hope is I, I think this, this, that there's a change is a coming in these places and people, people know it. I think we've got our students uh, who might have some questions, so maybe you'll introduce yourselves as we talk. This is... Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Bikari, and I am a dual uh, Master's of Public Policy and a Master's of Business Administration student here, and super excited to um, have the opportunity to ask, ask some questions. Yeah, um, I'm Anna Pomper. I'm an MPP here. Um, do a little bit of work with Poverty Solutions and um, got to read some of this book in an exclusive PDF offered yeah. via Professor Schaefer's uh, social welfare class last semester. So really excited to ask questions as well. So, do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So I think our first question is, the pandemic laid bare in striking terms the inequities faced by people, ba faced by people based on where they live and how race and other identities are related to place-based oppression. What is our way forward? 
take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do still think we're, we're at a little bit of a um, fork in the roads in this country. So uh, in, in my own professional life, I was utterly panicked at the start of the, of the COVID crisis about the economic crisis. I totally underestimated the public health crisis, but I knew what happened to uh, folks without a lot of money. And um, a divided government actually responded with a safety net that I think we can argue around the edges uh, could have been better, but like fundamentally was different from anything we'd ever done before in expanding, like understanding that our unemployment insurance system was broken and, and making benefits available through economic impact payments and of course through the expanded child tax credit. Um, through other programs that took a bit longer to roll out, like housing assistance, uh, but also did a lot of good. So, um, you know, that was just an incredible moment, like to lose 20 million jobs and actually see poverty decline and see all of these sort of indicators of economic hardship improve, uh, just was something I never imagined would happen. And now we seem to be sort of turning around and going the other direction again and just saying, okay, well, um, maybe some people didn't work because of the benefits. We actually have more Americans working now than we ever had uh, before. And you know, after you, um, turns out the retirees, new retirees, you're our problem as you're all retiring. If you, if you, I don't know if I have any new retirees in the building, but uh, that's what's driving down our labor force participation rate. But there is just this sense, I, partly because the economy was so strong, there were so many jobs around that like, it was impossible to find anyone. And uh, my social demographer colleagues like Natasha, will, I think will mention sort of the de decline in the you know, more recent populations of workers, like the numbers are just not there. So um, we seem to be just going back in that direction. And I think, and similarly, with like an understanding of uh, like the deep inequalities that we have, um, we seem to be moving in the other direction. So it, it seems like this is a moment for us to, to try to say, let's, let's not go back to where we were before. And, and I do think we see this in every single one of the communities that we're in, is that there are people who are willing to um, look and think differently about what kind of policies uh, we should have. Um, and so it's really, I think, a matter of building that and just continuing sort of the drumbeat of saying, let's, let it, let us, let's use this to go in a different direction as a country. And, and we already saw some of the benefits of, of that. In Michigan, we had this incredible other policy success of like very early on because um, Nicole's former colleague, Joni Caldoun, became the chief uh, sort of medical officer for the state of Michigan. And she put up data on, uh, on sort of rates of COVID cases and COVID deaths by race. And so Michigan was actually one of the very first places where we mm -hmm. saw this incredible disparity um, by race and by zip code. And, and the state government responded, and they put together a, a group that was led by Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist that actually put together, you know, put some policies into place. Um, and, uh, and we erased that disparity in, in not so long a time. And there's been some analyses that tell us how many lives were saved by that. So, you know, even, even in this moment of incredible hopelessness where it's like, they, you know, they can't even, Congress can't even figure out who the speaker is. Like, well, how can anything good be done? Um, like, like remembering that actually good things are possible, and like holding on to those, like, and figuring out how to lift those up at the local level and at the federal level is is the only answer. I'll just add that, that I want to hear from from you uh, that um, I'm always reminding my students that most policy is local policy, and so. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Great. I also want to thank the audience for the thoughtful questions that we're getting in. Um, uh, so uh, we talked, well, you talked a little bit about um, uh, the most disadvantaged communities and the most advantaged uh, communities. Um, you say that the most advantaged communities have the least co corruption, great social infrastructure, et cetera. Um, are those places that are most advantaged also the most homogeneous in both race and class? 
are there places that are advantaged but don't rely on either exclusion or homogeneity to achieve less corruption, greater, greater social infrastructure, or other markers of wellness? Yeah. Um, so there are a few communities among the very most disadvantaged that are in places like Alaska uh, that are um, majority um, Native Alaskan. Advantage. Most advantaged. Yeah. So there are some real surprises in the data that we have yet to fully explore. People in my, cla in my MPA classes at Princeton have been like tackling these places and trying to figure out you know, what's going on in these areas that uh, that leads in, and there's often a story of of good government, of good tribal government in the case of in the Alaskan case that has really taken advantage of a natural resource in a way that has created a diverse economy. Uh, so there's all kinds of goodies in the data, and you can go online and look at the data yourself. It's all publicly available, and and begin to uncover some of these stories yourselves. And and if you do, please let us know. We'll we'll put you up on our website and and, and begin to build this story. Uh, together, I will say that, though that there are a lot of very homogenous white places that are not advantaged at all. You saw uh, parts of Michigan, uh, Maine, um, where you see very deep disadvantage. Of course, we've got Appalachia, parts of Pennsylvania. So there are many. Uh, being <laughs> being majority white uh, is is uh, not sufficient. Um, but of course, we shouldn't be shocked to see. Uh, that white places are more advantaged because of all of the advantages historically that uh, that white people have have gotten as you know by virtue of their race. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question from the audience: In these disadvantaged places, did you see impacts of environmental hazards or climate change, for example? Um, for example, increased health risks due to heat or extreme weather events. Um, as well as impacts on infrastructure. So uh, we have a chapter on Marion County, South Carolina, and uh, that when we went to uh, Marion County, what we weren't expecting to write about there was uh, that they had been hit by three severe weather events in you know, a small number of years. So two uh, hurricanes that had come up the eastern seaboard and one severe flood. Uh, it's a community that sits at sort of the meeting point of two rivers, and so flooding is a, is a major issue. And so uh, in that chapter that's called The Invisible Hand, uh, we uh, learned all about what happens when a community gets hit uh, by these uh, severe weather events, which are coming with uh, increasing frequency uh, on the eastern seaboard. It, lo it looks like floods. Uh, in the west, it's fires. Uh, but a lot of the um, eastern seaboard also has like floods and a lot of wetness and then severe dry spells as well. So there's just the, the extreme nature is growing. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times in, in our analysis, we think of something like homeownership as, a, as a, a binary, right, a dichotomous thing. You own a home or you don't. Um, but so many of the residents in these communities actually have clouded title or uh, uh, properties that have been passed through from generation to generation referred to as heirs property. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have that for, uh, for the long sort of course of history, it's very difficult actually then to get help um, for um, a home that's been flooded out because you can't prove that you own the home. Um, and, and also, if your home is monetarily essentially worthless uh, before, if it's sort of deemed monetarily worthless, uh, they're not going to give you any help to, to build it back. And so our policies that actually help uh, families after a severe flood, um, they have the effect of, of higher income communities where people have clear title, they have homes that are you know, in reasonably good shape, uh, they're able to navigate complicated bureaucratic systems, um, and these tend to be predominantly white communities. They actually end up financially better off in the long term for having been hit by a flood because they get things fixed up in their house, and maybe things weren't perfect before the flood a lot of the time, right? Um, and uh, communities of color and low-income communities actually end up poorer after because they're not able to access um, the help. So we have a policy that's actually meant to help people with a crisis that's coming with more frequency that doesn't just like keep inequality where it was, but actually makes inequality worse, right? It stratifies communities. 
And you know, there is this connection to the history that I was just talking about of um, sort of uh, land ownership among black Americans going back for uh, centuries and sort of white authorities uh, that were using many different means to sort of strip that land that uh, I think sort of plays into, you know, why like a huge fraction of, of black Americans in the South had, they own the land they own through heirs' property. So again, you can't divorce it from history. But that gives us sort of a very clear policy window of what can we do to make those systems work better. And the Biden administration, to their credit, after hearing from us and others, um, now have a process in place where heirs' property isn't going to keep you from getting help. It still remains to be seen if that's going to actually work or not. If that's going to, if it, you know, just is another bureaucratic layer that has its own impact or not. I would add uh, one other one other point, and I want to build on your earlier point, Kathy, of uh, all policy is at some point it becomes local policy. Yeah. Because the other thing that uh, gives me hope and is a point of like what what can we do, which I think is the the the, the uh, sort of at the core of the question there is. In local systems, when you are sure that local mm -hmm. government isn't corrupt and when local government is competent and focused and uh, eager to make not just practical uh, solutions but also affect policy where that's possible, you end up with policy opportunities at the local level that can yeah. happen irrespective of what happens at yeah. the federal level. Mm -hmm. So in Detroit, for example, Mayor Duggan is working on a policy called Tangle Title, which will untangle uh, the, the, uh, the conditions that Luke and Kathy and Tim have named in the book, right? Is there a way that locally a city gover mm -hmm. government can address that issue so that no matter what happens, more broadly or federally, you right. get some relief at the local level. And I, you know, I'm just really grateful to Poverty Solutions for all the ways you've helped us uncover where those possibilities are so that we can build on them. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they can do that whether or not we have a speaker. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so, so building off of that, you mentioned um, land ownership and assets as a way to combat racial inequality. You also referenced the omni shambles of Congress right now. Um, I'm wondering, given, and the audience is wondering, I should say, uh, <laughs> given the current political climate in the United States, how realistic do you think implementing a national reparations program would be? What responsibility or role does the U.S. Govern government, the federal government, have in implementing this? You know, uh, there are certain le lessons to be learned from other places doing reparations. We spend part of our time in Northwest Ontario, and of course um, uh, their reparations have been made to people uh, who were as children, stolen from their families and forced to attend residential schools. Uh, there is a uh, reservation just north of where, uh, where our little cabin is, um, and it is astonishing how many people uh, locally there had been uh, forced to attend these schools and the impacts on families are, are terrible but also of course they have found evidence um, even in this tiny little town the school these children attended of, of uh, more than 170 um, uh, human remains uh, from children uh, living in these underfunded and horrific places. So we should be learning from uh, these places. Uh, there, you have your own expert, I think, right here um, at the University mm -hmm. of Michigan, Earl Lewis, Earl Lewis mm -hmm. who is doing some really creative work on how to actually build maybe on, uh, on the expertise of local, uh, local people, but also local universities in building programs of reparation. Uh, there, are, it's early days, I think. Um, you know, we've got the example of of maybe places who have done it and not done it not so well. I'm thinking of Georgetown and Evanston, um, uh, Illinois, that have both have instituted reparations. But this is something you all should be uh, looking at really, really carefully. And, ag and again, the, ca the Canadian example is, is one of, of, you know, maybe short-term but quite meaningful uh, reparations. Uh, the politics of these little towns around these reparations, as you can imagine, is is interesting and something we should 
um, be learning more about too. Yeah, I think the local, uh, the local drives on reparations are uh, the most interesting thing uh, going on in the space given where the federal government is. And um, the Center for Social Solutions here in Michigan, it's been a part of efforts in many different places all across the country. And um, the Detroit Metropolitan Area Community Survey uh, and MARA have uh, some really uh, interesting publications on like Detroiters' views of reparations. There's now a task force, uh, an official task force for the city of Detroit that I know Trina has been uh, working with um, that are looking at this. And, and there's lots of other policy uh, stories where local uh, initiatives actually end up with uh, federal policy change, right? They sort of change the conversation. So um, I think, you know, to me, that's, that's where the momentum is. Great. Um, actually, going off of that, um, in your research, did you find any other inspiring examples where local programs or community-based efforts were helping correct the structural inequ inequities embodied in the space? So the, just quickly, this is a question people often ask. You know, I had an economist friend say to me, why didn't you find places that were identical in 1950 and made different decisions. <laughs> and you know, the world doesn't actually offer those cells because they're empty ones. <laughs> so I think, you know, I teach in a policy school and, and one of the things I tell my students is, this is your work. This is your work. And uh, we will do everything we can to inspire you, but you are the doers, the implementers, and uh, the visionaries. That's the only way to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I have like three qu three questions I want to ask off of that. I, you mentioned in, at the end of the book public libraries and funding public libraries, and I'm thinking about Julie's question about you know local organizations that are sort of doing the work, um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what public libraries do for uh, for this issue? Well, we, we actually got the term social infrastructure from a sociologist named Eric Kleinenberg, who wrote a book called Palaces for the People. And it's actually a phrase taken from, I think, Carnegie, who funded a lot of public libraries. Um, and so what he really writes about that book, and we saw it in the communities that, that we looked at, is the, the libraries, to the extent that they have programming and they have other things going on there, they become really central places of social infrastructure. And one of the key things about social infrastructure is it brings people of all kinds together. There's no price of admission that people are not, um, that people are excluded from. Or in the case, I often get the question about, well, churches, what's going on with the churches? <laughs> well, uh, it's complicated. Um, so in Kentucky, for example, uh, a lot of the poorer folk really felt like they were looked down upon by the church folk. And like, you know, if they had any kind of, uh, you know, if they'd been divorced or they just didn't have the right kind of clothes or whatever. So if you have a, a place of in potential infrastructure that really sets a lot of boundaries around it, either moral or financial or otherwise, it will never really receive, you know, get its potential. Libraries, and I used to be a librarian, so I'm really happy about this, but uh, uh, libraries are like designed to be really welcoming to people. Um, and um, so yeah, so libraries are key. And, and we've talked to, I guess it was the FDA folk about um, one thing that USDA. the government, yeah. oh yeah, the USDA can um, fund our libraries. Um, and so, so we really were cheerleading that with, with that group. Nicole, did you end up working on libraries uh, in your time in, in the city or other yeah. social infrastructure? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So libraries are actually not controlled by the city uh, in Detroit. So there's little, we, we leveraged um, CARES funding, which mm -hmm. as some of you may remember was the funding before ARPA. Uh, to ensure some programming where possible. Um, and certainly libraries are an active part of discussion around the District of Detroit, which is the Stephen Ross uh, 
Mike Illich, uh, I shouldn't say that, the Illich Company's uh, <laughs> investment uh, in Midtown. So certainly we, we believe, as you saw and said, Tim, that libraries are, are central to, um, to rebuilding community fabric. We, um, we, you know, we have good relationships with boys and girls clubs and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, our summer youth employment programs are all designed around community. And so we're thinking about infrastructure, but often in city government, what ends up happening is you are, because you are firefighting and you are addressing dumpster fire after dumpster fire after dumpster yeah. fire, mm -hmm. there's little opportunity to pull up and think about how do we rebuild, how do we thoughtfully and proactively uh, mm -hmm. rebuild mm -hmm. infrastructure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a little moderator's, moderator's privilege and ask a question I've been wanting to know the answer to. Um, so, you know, I think about social impact a lot, and I was wondering, you know, is there a role for social impact minded investors to fill gaps left by government policies and programs? I'm, for example, I'm thinking about the expiration of the child care stabilization grant and the large gap in funding left by the expiration and the political kind of upheaval that happened. So my question is, is it ethical for social investors to garner profit while also addressing these gaps or is government always the answer? You know, I, I know that the Jeff Liebman, for example, is a, at the Kennedy School. Is, is Coming in two weeks. Yeah, he's done a lot of work around this, so you better put that question to him. <laughs> um, but I will say that um, well, I'll make the controversial statement that um, so in areas of child support and other social services, even mm. TANF, mm. uh, for-profit players have increasingly played a role. Mm. And if, of course, if you talk to people at the state levels, don't shoot me. Uh, they hate that they hate the contractors, uh, the vendors. They call them the vendors. Uh, but if you talk to people, um, you know, who are heading the national office, they'll say the vendors are the vectors. You know, Ricky Tereski used to say this, and like, what does that mean? Uh, so there's a lot of there's innovation that can come um, from a, a, from non-governmental actors. Uh, so. Rather than paint, you know, I was converted by some of the stories I heard from for-profit actors, uh, at least in the child supports um, and TANF spaces. Uh, it, it's kind of amazing when, uh, so one program I observed in Oklahoma takes TANF recipients and actually puts them in a beautiful building with, uh, with lovely chairs and, and pictures and, and, you know, there are lovely mm -hmm. things to eat and, and, uh, so this is a this is a contract, right? DHS gives to this for-profit organization, and uh, so they have to send state workers to supervise, and the state workers over and over again say, "This is my favorite thing to do," and because it, it just somehow there's something about a mm. these degraded government bureaucracies for poor people. And, I mean, we did this; we made them the way they are. You know, we write about a, a god awful welfare. Um, well, for office in Chicago, um, they're mostly all that way. Um, so we made them that way, but then it's it's really demoralizing for people mm -hmm. to access these these mm -hmm. programs. And so sometimes uh, the for profits have come in and done some real innovation. I think especially around uh, producing um, or trying to create a sense of dignity uh, around the receipt of services. So. Yeah, I mean, just to take that to the logical, Kathy Eden. Uh, next step, I would just mention tax prep. So mm -hmm. many families go to for-profit tax prep, and uh, you know most of our discussion about that is like, how do they not know they can go to Vita? You know, they can do nonprofit and save money, and they need financial budgeting classes, or you know, they need they need help learning what to do. I think it, you know, it's not like M4, which was Kathy's book with Sarah Helper Meekin and Laura Talk. Um, I think makes the argument that people go to tax prep because, you know, um, what, what was the one? You've got people, right? The, You've got people. I'm a, I'm, H and R blocks. I'm uh, a real American. Yeah, it it provided a sense of dignity uh, that uh, that some of the other services don't. I actually think the same is true for payday lenders too. Like the it 
it's not just that people are desperate for the money that they go to payday lenders, but of all the institutions in my experience, poor families uh, distrust banks uh, is right, right up there. And payday lenders treat people with dignity, uh, and they treat them like customers. So I do think there are lessons there. Um, a lot of times when uh, services become privately funded, I'm thinking of child welfare, mm -hmm. I think the outcomes are pretty poor mm -hmm. yeah. in the aggregate, but we can learn things about like the messages we're sending to families. Um, I think we can do one more question. Um, so Professor Eden, you, uh, you mentioned that you know, this is our work. So my question, our question, the audience's question and my question, is um, how do we do that work? What can students at Michigan do to combat this form of injustice? I'm thinking about the opportunity index that Poverty Solutions has and how that illuminates injustice of place. Um, what are the concrete things that we should be doing? What are the organizations we should be looking for? What's the kind of work that we should be identifying? Nicole, you should weigh in to. on this question too, but she started with you, Kathy, so you should start. So I, I teach a course like Luke does in poverty and social policy, and we spend one week discussing the problem, the next week discussing the solutions. And uh, what you generally see is that the problem is like this. The problem is like this, and the <laughs> solutions are like this. <laughs> and, and, you know, so then we look at all the RTCs and the, the evidence on these little programs, you know. And uh, my charge to them is... Um, the whole point of this course is that we, our efforts are ridiculously small. And your job is to keep that big picture in mind. And even if you're doing something incremental, it doesn't mean that's bad. Uh, but to keep in mind that that's not the goal. Uh, when I've worked with policy, people who've gone back and forth to Washington, as many of my colleagues are, it can be easy, and I don't know what, what you would have to say about this, Nicole, to, to, to focus on a win. Like, okay, I'm in this god-awful job where I'm working too much and I'm getting paid too little, and I want to win. And so sometimes what I see is, is um, and we do this too, right? If we have a policy win, we try to exaggerate its importance. I don't think that's true with the child tax credit, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you want to sort of reward yourself psychologically for all of the work you're putting in. Um, and so to keep those wins in perspective and, and to keep the sort of the big picture in mind, to read read history, think deeply about, um, I would say reading history uh, and doing ethnography are two of the more, most important things anyone can do and if you can't do it, read it. Um, get a sense of, get a sense of, of uh, you know, David Elwood, who used to be the dean of the Kennedy School, uh, he ran a lot of government agencies, and the first thing he would do with his staff is he'd send them out into the field to talk to people. I was a part of this big initiative he led, um, funded by the Gates Foundation, called the U.S. Partnership for Mobility from Poverty. We went on field trips uh, to community after community after community all over the United States just to listen to people. So keeping your ear to the ground, keeping your eyes focused on history, and maybe um, a little comfort from big data. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's just a good, um, that's just a good tripod uh, to keep at the back of your work. Yeah, I, I would add to that, Kathy, get in the trenches. Find government that works well near you, somewhere near you, and get in the trenches. Your understanding of the problem, the scale and scope of current solutions and what's possible will only be enhanced. Like you think you understand it by reading it, you have got to get to the front line and bring your ideas and your energy and your enthusiasm and another pair of hands. Get into the work in a public-private partnership to understand what's really happening. Come alongside a unit of city government that works well or find a philanthropic partner uh, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, like we're going to start really leaning into this notion of where where can we form more public-private partnerships and get policy students uh, and universities involved so that we are hacking away at these wicked problems together. That's well said. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right.
Well, on that note, we're at 5.30. I think there might be some cookies out there. Donuts. Oh, okay. So thanks, everyone, for coming. And don't, forget I, don't forget to, yeah, no, I think all the books are gone. Okay. They've been taken. <laughs>